Welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Corey. I work on the Open Space Project at the American Museum of Natural History. We are so excited to be bringing you this broadcast. Um, it's very special. It's for Earth Science Week. Uh, and it's in partnership with StarNet's NASA at My Library and the American Library Association. Uh, if you're able to stick around for the whole broadcast, we have a survey. We'd really love your feedback. Uh, and some lucky responders are going to get a NASA logo sticker. So that's pretty cool. So without further ado, I'd like to bring on Carter Emmert. He's our Director of Astro Visualization at the American Museum of Natural History. Carter. Hi, Corey. Hi. Uh, have fun. Well, we're, uh, we're uh, really uh, thrilled to have you all here today and uh, talk about um, really this uh, view from space of the Earth. And, and uh, But um, before we jump into that, I want to mention that we have uh, an active chat uh, on board. And so we have, uh, we have two scientists of note here that uh, will be able to take your questions. And uh, some questions may filter up and uh, to, to meet, for me to answer on screen. Uh, but we have Marina Gemma. She's a planetary scientist with us at the American Museum of Natural History. And we're very happy to have Dr. Allegra Legrand from um, the uh, Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And she is a um, climate scientist, an uh, Earth scientist. And uh, so she, uh, both of them will be in the chat to uh, answer questions. And then hopefully at the end, we'll also have a wrap up with time for questions. So. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to get into open space. This is free and interactive software. Uh, it runs on sort of video game technology, but it's visualizing science. Everything that we show here is a calculation, is a, is a map that's been put together by NASA or uh, other entities that, that bring together things. We'll talk about that. Um, and open space, if you're interested, is from that website right there. We also have team members from open space in the chat as well. So if you have interest in that, uh, please go there. So we're going to start off uh, here with open space. And this topic is about, of course, Earth. And uh, But I show us Mars here. We're going to start off just showing us Mars. This is These are satellite images that have been mapped onto Mars. And, and uh, open space, we actually have a physics-based model that shows the atmosphere, very similar to the topic we're going to be talking about, Earth. Now, we also, uh, uh, we introduce this just to really emphasize that our understanding of us as a planet, of course, we know that we're a planet, and we've known that, say, back to Copernicus time, um, but to really sort of study us, it was going into space, and really the uh, 50 years, or 50, 60 years of the, of the space program, has enabled us to really learn a lot about not only our planet, but in context to other planets. And so what we're seeing here at Mars, and we see uh, lines, these lines that uh, wrap around Mars are the two moons, Phobos and Close, and then Deimos. And then also we see a line extending away uh, from Mars here, and that's the trail. So we are visualizing um, that uh, open space is this interactive, meaning that I'm piloting this and guiding us right now, um, but through scientific data. So we have the calculations of exactly uh, where the planets are. Um, I've gone back to, I believe, uh, let's see, this is October 1st. I'm going to pull away from Mars, and now we see um, the solar system, and then the blue line, Earth. And on October 1st, which was just two weeks ago, we were about to sweep underneath Mars, between Mars and the sun. And of course, that happened uh, night before last. Uh, and so that we're now pulling away from Mars. We orbit faster around the sun. I'm going to now focus on Earth and travel across the solar system um, back to our home planet. And as we get closer, we may notice uh, something else we see. And or we're coming in on the night side of Earth, but we see another sort of thin line, and that's uh, that of the moon, the moon orbiting the Earth, about uh, 240,000 miles away. And we're now going to come closer up to our planet. And uh, as I get closer, we can see uh, this trail, just as we saw Mars. And we see satellite images that have been mapped uh, onto the planet that we visualize in open space. And uh, we see the arc of an orbit of a satellite that actually uh, maps the planet uh, 
there as well. What I'm going to do is just toggle off the orbit lines um, of, it, uh, uh, of the solar system so we can concentrate on Earth as a planet. And um, before I, I, I show um, the, the mechanics of the, of, of, uh, of, of the satellites and how they map our planet, I just want to sort of gaze at this beautiful orb of the Earth. Notice how Mars is sort of desert red. And it's actually, it's color. People see that Mars is red and they think that it must be hot. Mars is very cold, in fact. It's a red desert with uh, iron oxide all over the surface making it red. A um, few clouds, but Earth is the water planet, so it's blue. And uh, the blue is caused mainly because of the scattering of, uh, of, of the sun's light through, through the atmosphere. Um, and uh, so that creates this blue cast. Um, and uh, then we also see um, primarily as we come up, before we see the geography of Earth, we really notice a sort of filigree of the, of the beautiful clouds, a sort of lacy pattern of clouds across the planet. And um, so what we're looking at here um, is North and South America in this current pose. Let me pull um, my uh, cursor over uh, to point out, let me, uh, I just have to move something around to let me see that better. But I can point out if you can now see, this is, uh, this is the United States in here, and then we have Mexico, we can see Baja, California, and Florida happens to be underneath some clouds. Again, this is October 1st. Uh, and um, I'll just uh, rotate around so that we can now see the continent of South America traced out here. Here are the Andes Mountains, mountain chain, and the Amazon basin. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, but how is it, how are these images obtained? Now, when we flew to the moon, uh, we used to do that uh, um, generations ago now, about 50 years ago, so about two generations back is, is when we flew to the moon, um, that we were able, to, the astronauts were able to get pictures and uh, take pictures um, with film and uh, on their trips to the moon. But um, as we began to access space, this digital imagery, we, we don't send film back from, from Mars to get these pictures. All of this is digi di digital. And so the uh, images are sent back as ones and zeros and then uh, put together as images. They are acquired by satellites. Uh, you may notice that uh, I have a label that's on top of Earth that says ISS for the International Space Station. And um, everything's just sort of going along. Um, in fact, I have time stopped here for the moment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to speed up time for us. And I'm going to, I'm going to start the clock and, uh, so that we can now see that things go around. Now, everything is in motion in, in space. Just as we saw sort of the, the trail of Mars and then the Earth and the inner inner planets of Venus and Mercury, I didn't point out, but uh, um, that we have the, the trails. We, we depict the sort of history of where, um, in this case, is sat with the satellite is going to come back around called SNPP, stands for the SUMI, NPP satellite. Um, this is a uh, joint project between NASA um, and uh, our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. And, uh, but of course, we have astronauts on board the International Space Station, and they go around. Now, I mentioned I have time running fast here. And um, so uh, how fast are we going? We're going about five minutes per second. And um, really, uh, if I slowed this down to one second per second, we'd hardly see these move. Um, but uh, we actually do one orbit at this distance away from the Earth. Um, in about 90 minutes, so an hour and a half. The International Space Station orbits only about uh, 250 miles off the surface. That's about the width of the state of Pennsylvania. And um, so it's just high enough to really be above the atmosphere and um, that the atmosphere is held close to the Earth by the mass of the Earth. It holds this veil of, of atmosphere on it. So what I'm going to do is uh, just... Pause time. I'm going to let's actually um, uh, come around to the night side because the, the Earth is spinning. And uh, so it goes through this day night cycle. And I'll just, I'll, let me, I'll, I'll just 
speed this up a little more. And um, I'll pull back and uh, I'll just emphasize that we do have other satellites uh, around the Earth, many, many. And uh, let me bring them up for you. So I do this. There, we can see many, many different satellites. We can see many that are in close, like the International Space Station and uh, the SUMI NPP satellite, which I'm going to talk more about in a moment. But we also see um, this sort of belt around the Earth's equator, and uh, that they're out, uh, they orbit slower than the satellites that are in closer. So this belt around the Earth that uh, is primarily parked above the equator is what we call the geosynchronous satellites. And maybe if I come back around into sunlight a little bit, like so, that uh, we may see that notice how we see Africa down below us and that these satellites are orbiting at the same rate of rotation of Earth, uh, that the Earth rotates. And um, so I'm gonna stop time um, just uh, to sort of come in, come back a little closer. We also see some satellites in between. These are the uh, um, satellites that are mainly for the geo, uh, global positioning satellites, the GPS satellites, and uh, that we're gonna just come, come back down and uh, we're gonna turn off uh, the main belt of satellites. And I just wanna focus on, on this, uh, how we actually map the Earth and how this image is obtained. Um, the satellite goes around basically from pole to pole. And at this date, we can see we're uh, just uh, about um, uh, just about two weeks ago, uh, we were closer to the equinox, which means sort of even lighting between the North and the South Pole. Of course, now we're going further into winter. And uh, as the Earth goes around the sun, it has seasons uh, because it is tilted with respect to its orbit around the sun. But here we can see uh, Antarctica, and uh, we can see also a lot of sea ice underneath the white clouds. And you can kind of tell it's underneath because if I come close enough, you can see that the clouds have shadows on them. And so they stand sort of, uh, the shadows underneath them, so we, that they stand above the uh, sea ice and also um, the, uh, the ice that covers the continent of Antarctica. And so we see the clouds, we see the atmosphere, and what I'm going to emphasize now is a, um, just some of the artifacts that we see by mapping the Earth and uh, in this way that the satellite goes around. I'll just pull back again about to here, and I'm going to go to, this is, uh, once again, we're, we're rotating with the Earth. Now, and notice that the stars are going by in the background. So we kind of set to rotate with the Earth as the satellite goes by. So if I pause right here and that the satellite goes by, it's acquiring images. And if I get closer to this image, we'll actually see kind of an artifact of the mapping process. Notice there's this um, discontinuous line of, uh, within the picture and slight uh, um, difference in, in uh, coloration. And that's basically a, a slight difference in color. So the satellite has gone around, acquired images, and then it, the Earth has turned and it comes back around. And so when it comes over the day side of Earth, it takes these pictures, they're acquired, and they're assembled into a what we call a global mosaic every day. And we are accessing this map from our partners at um, the Goddard Space Flight Center, operated by NASA, so NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, from the, what they call their Global Imagery Browse Service, and uh, NASA Gibbs, and they actually produce these, these daily images, a mosaic of the Earth, down to um, about half uh, a kilometer, or about a, a quarter mile in resolution. So, okay, so that's how the satellite works. What I'd like to do is, is come down a little closer now um, to the to the Earth, and I've talked about the atmosphere, and we see the effect of the atmosphere. It seems to, like a very sharp cutoff. Um, and what I'm going to do is come in a little closer and a little closer. I'm going to come down over um, the Andes and over the west coast of of South America. I'm going to come in over Peru, and as I do, I'm going to tip the Earth over so that we can see that that sharp line that looks sharp from farther away 
which is the trail off of our atmosphere into space, into the black of space, is, is what uh, the astronauts uh, actually see. I'm at an altitude about twice that of the space station. I'm going to come down. Oh, here we are. We're at the height of the space station right now. I, 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 I could follow along with the space station, but I just really want to show you how thin the atmosphere actually is um, from this vantage point. So we're just a, um, we're about 400 kilometers, about two, 250 miles off the Earth, and you can see how thin that atmosphere is. We also see the trail of the uh, SUNY MPP satellite. Um, even if I, if I get a little closer, that uh, we can now see that that atmosphere is so very thin, and the astronauts talk about this, just how thin the atmosphere is, almost scary thin. I'm going to pan eastward so that we're looking across uh, um, the green of the Amazon, and uh, that we see uh, clouds over over the dry um, sort of desert uh, of of um, Peru as we proceed uh, westward toward the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific Ocean just below us. What I'm going to do now is fade between this satellite view, and I'm going to reveal sort of a cloudless Earth. We're going to keep that atmosphere on. We see that. And uh, so now we see how, um, how dry and brown um, that this part of uh, South America is west of the Andes mountain chain. Why is this? Well, what we see, we see the very green Amazon basin, and we're about to go there. What I'm going to talk about now are the... the um, biomes of Earth, and, and uh, that they're sort of created by this effect of the circulation patterns of, of uh, the flow of the atmosphere, and, uh, and also that, the, um, uh, and that this, is, this is set up by the winds of Earth, and, uh, and I'm going to talk about how, how they're driven, but these circulation patterns dictate within the geography of Earth domains for plants and animals, flora and fauna. And uh, so that w if we have, in this case, as we look at, at the Andes mountain chain, we see, uh, we, we see um, to the right is, is east and to the left is west. I'm just um, setting this up so it's like that. And uh, so th that we see a lot of green in the Amazon rainforest, which is to the east of the Andes mountains. And because the flow of, of coming off the ocean brings in um, a lot of uh, warm and wet air and that it rains out across the Amazon basin. And um, then that air tries to flow westward. And uh, so as the air comes up the Andes Mountains, that it condenses and rains out. The air that flows over, over the mountains is then dry. And so we have desert west of the Andes mountain chain. So biomes are these realms that are set up by these circulation patterns. Now I mentioned, I was going to explain that the circulation, how these circulation patterns are set up. We still see some clouds uh, in, uh, in the background that's sort of an artifact of how this is, okay, now they've cleared off. So there's a question coming in. Biome is a major, <laughs> this is a point, major community of plants and animals with similar life forms and environmental conditions. So these conditions, how this is set up, what we have is um, the earth, you know, we're sort of right along, the, we're, the Amazon basin is, is just below the equator. So the equator is warm. Why is the equator warm and why was there ice when we looked at Antarctica? Well, the reason for this is that um, is basically lighting of Earth. If I pull back out, I can just sort of make that point. And um, so I'll just rise up. Oh, uh, we have a question coming in from Hunter Kennedy. Does the atmosphere appear more or less uh, thin depending on what part of the world you're looking down on? Actually, um, Hunter, that's, that's a really good question. And I'd like to point out uh, that um, as we go to the biome of the Himalayas, um, where the land and, and uh, Himalayas and the, the Tibetan uh, plateau. We're going to talk about that. But in that case, um, the atmosphere is is uh, it's a it's a it's a constant thickness, essentially down to uh, sea level. But depending on how high you are up in the mountains, you're sticking up into thinner and thinner air. And that's basically just the physics of, of gravity. Once again, okay, we look at the Earth. 
and uh, uh, Antarctica down here um, being cold and icy. And then we have a rainforest uh, in the case of South America where it rains a lot and is warm and wet. And that's because as the earth turns, well, uh, just uh, we saw it turning earlier. I'll just set this up once again. Here we go. And uh, the earth is turning day and night. It sets up these patterns because earth is, is under the lamplight of the sun. And so with that, uh, essentially what happens is the equator is warm, is warmer than the poles. And uh, as you, we all know, it's, it's cooler at night than during the day, and that's because of the radiance of the sun. The net result, result of this is that, uh, that as the earth heats up over the equator, that hot air wants to rise. And in the case of over the oceans, it's going to uh, be humid and it's gonna rise up as it rises because it's like a balloon, it's lighter because it's hot. It rises and then cools off as it gets higher and that's what forms the clouds. And then it wants to also spread toward the North and South Poles. Vivian Trukinski asked, do other planets have clouds? Yes, Mars has um, a, a few clouds. And then as we go farther out into the solar system, we have uh, planets uh, such as Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, which are gas giants. These are, these are, uh, um, uh, these are planets that are almost entirely composed of atmosphere. Venus actually has very thick clouds. Earth, we have this balance of between the oceans, which cover three quarters of the Earth. We only, the land area is only well, sort of one third, one quarter of the Earth, is that uh, this equilibrium in the balance between the heating of the, of, of the oceans and uh, the equator, um, and that, 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 uh, that air rises and it's warm and wet, it condenses, forms our clouds and it rains out. So these circulation patterns define our biomes. Let's come back down and look at the Amazon. The Amazon River is the largest river in the world. It, uh, it, ha it basically, it has about a thousand tributaries that come together. It's called the lungs of the world because this forest is so vast. It's actually, it takes in the carbon dioxide that we breathe out, all animals breathe out, and it produces the oxygen that we need to breathe. And so this is an incredibly important resource for us, and it extends across many different countries. Um, and uh, just, you know, we we're looking at the earth uh, sort of confused by clouds, and now with the clouds removed pretty much, these are all satellite images, but they were sort of cloud-free images stitched together and come down. We can see the river, it's uh, fairly laden with sediment coming off um, the Andes Mountains. And uh, that's why we see it, it's, it's muddy. And uh, then it flows across this forest and it brings the nutrients of what it's eroding off the mountains across this plain. And this is what um, the uh, rainforest grows on. And uh, so this breathing of the atmosphere is, is what's, what's happening across the Amazon. Many, many animals um, and of course, uh, many different plant species. This is um, a tremendous bio, bio diverse, uh, area for biodiversity. And of course, they're also people. And um, so there, there is uh, uh, various cities across this and uh, parts of the Amazon are in fact being developed. If I come in here just a little closer, just looking at my time as well, that we can see the effects of, of the, this almost looking like a Christmas tree pattern of, um, of, of settlement. Uh, this, is, this is where um, people are, are, have moved into the rainforest and have cut parts of the rainforest down um, for growing crops. So um, this balance between uh, the needs of our biosphere and the needs of humans, uh, of course, we're in the mix too. Is, is important. We can also see um, here at the, uh, um, the delta of the Amazon is the sediment flowing out into the Atlantic Ocean. I want to point out one more thing that the astronauts also talk about when they're from this perspective. When we look at Earth in this way, where we're looking at how it really looks from space, 
We are also showing across the ocean. Actually, we're visualizing data that we would not see, and that's bathymetry. And so that shows you darker blue where the ocean is deeper and lighter blue where we see the shallows of the ocean. So we're, we're visualizing that. But there's another point here too, and I'm going to just pop up a little bit again. The clouds start to kind of reappear. I'm gonna reset the lighting um, so that uh, our next destination, we're gonna um, go across, the satellites are going around, but we're going to now go across the ocean to the continent of Africa. And the point I'd like to make is perhaps best made if I just pull out once again, we see uh, with the clouds, we see the continent, we see the geography of the planet, but it's, you know, there are many countries down here. And while we're, we're seeing all of them, um, that what we're not seeing are borders. The borders are something that are a concept that are a sociological concept uh, um, and uh, that, that we divide the earth up into zones and places and, and ownership. But in this case, what we see is right, hey, the borders are not visible from space. Um, we're all on this sort of one planet together. Corey, is there a question? Yeah, before we get into a new biome, I was yeah. wondering how much of the planet is covered by rainforest? Well, um, that's actually a good question. Um, I, uh, the, 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 uh, um, the Earth, once again, I, I mentioned how the Earth is divided up into uh, three quarters ocean and uh, somewhere between a third and one quarter land. And out of that, uh, deserts, uh, well, we're about to go to deserts, are about 10% um, uh, 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 is covered by desert. And that, that also includes the deserts of the poles. We don't think is of ice being up at the North and South Pole as deserts, but they're very dry. And so we're about to see the effect of, of that dryness, as we saw on uh, you know the west of the Andes mountain chain. Awesome. And Thanks, Carter. Okay, and then um, also um, uh, about half of the land surface of, of Earth is is habitable. I mean, habitable meaning that you know we don't want to live in deserts and we don't want to live on mountaintops. Uh, some people do, perhaps. Um, but uh, um, so, and now out of that, about half of that is what we consider uh, agriculture. So we're coming to the largest uh, um, hot desert. As I mentioned, uh, how you know deserts. Are Poles too because they're dry, but this is the Sahara, and then uh, it extends all the way across the continent of Africa, and so we're going to move across it. As we do, I'm going to just mention that it was about 8,000 years ago that this very dry area of the earth um, was actually covered by forest and, and grasslands. It's gotten drier. And this is because the climate has changed over this period. Now, some of you may know that you know, we've had the ice age and the retreat of the glaciers and uh, how there are a bunch of animals that used to be around that aren't anymore, like the saber-toothed tiger and, and the woolly mammoths and all that. They've gone away um, within this mix of, of climate changing conditions. Um, but uh, um, geologists um, go out into the field and, and the Sahara and see the evidence of how the climate has changed literally just thousands of years ago. If we're looking down now at this geography, what's exciting is that we can see um, exposed rock where it's darker in the Agar Mountains as we come out into the central Sahara. But also there's, um, we can see the, the effect of the winds that cause streaks um, across uh, these geographic uh, across landforms and effectively what we're seeing is dust that's been blown around it accumulates into sand dunes so if I just come up into an area like this we can come down and we can see the mixture of the darker exposed and uh, and carved rock that we see in, in the mountainous areas and then also in in these uh, uh, more warmer colors uh, we can see uh, the sand dunes themselves and uh, this map is uh, pulled together by various satellites um, and uh, is uh, shared with us in open space from the company Esri. It's the world's largest geographic information systems company. And um, so we're, we're quite um, happy that uh, we have this collaboration uh, with NASA and other entities academically to bring you this, uh, this software. 
So as I come up, um, I'll come up higher. We'll uh, course farther eastward, and I'm coming up to the northeast portion of where Africa gives way to the Middle East up here at the Red Sea. But we also see the green sinuous path of the Nile River and then the green Nile River Delta. And uh, this uh, is, is green. It's because of the flow of the Nile um, from farther south in Africa and uh, being quite fertile across the uh, uh, Nile uh, Delta. Um, also green across Israel and then um, farther up and across into we see Turkey and the desert band coming across the Arabian Peninsula. But we can also see the green, uh, the Tigris and Euphrates River and um, uh, that uh, across Iraq. And this uh, sort of forms the fertile crescent uh, of antiquity uh, of when this, uh, where um, civilization sort of began. So as I come up uh, farther, I'm going to uh, just um, rotate the uh, light uh, further so that we can see further uh, eastward. And we have a question from, from Stephen Schreier, if I'm saying your name properly, hopefully. Um, there's a lot of space debris orbiting the Earth. Does it create a hazard for astronauts on the ISS? Yes. Excellent presentation, software. Thank you. Um, that uh, space junk is something uh, to uh, be concerned about. I mentioned I, we showed all those satellites. Uh, once again, maybe, uh, maybe I'll be so bold as to try to turn the satellites on uh, just for a second. Let's see if this works. Um, there. And so you know, the ISS is orbiting amongst all this other stuff. Now, we're not showing you everything. We're showing you individual satellites. I'll turn them back off. But orbiting up there is, uh, and now space is big, and even the International Space Station is about the size of a football field is small compared to you know, uh, all the space that's up there. So the likelihood is small, but space debris is something to worry about. Notice how the desert band here uh, reaches uh, even farther east across um, Iran and Afghanistan. Uh, Emily Schmitz asks, uh, how many satellites are there currently? Oh, this is a question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt this question um, into our chat. And uh, our engineer, uh, 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 <laughs> Mike Ajnapura, may know actually the tally of satellites, how many. Um, and I, 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 uh, I, I don't want to be wrong in my answer to that. So I, I'm actually not sure how many satellites are actually in open space. Um, they're being tracked by NORAD, the North American Air Defense. And uh, uh, we go to a website to uh, basically every time we run open space to get the latest orbital parameters um, that will run. As I'm getting farther eastward, uh, we're going to see the continent of India down below us. And so we see India and uh, the island of, uh, let's see, I, once again, I have to move this. So I'm going to, uh, so we have India here. And then along here is the, are the Himalayan mountain chain. And up uh, north of it, um, so north is, is up in this direction, is the, is the Tibetan plateau covered with lots of lakes. It's a tundra area um, of high altitude, so low shrublands. But we can see this tremendous green across Nepal and India and also Pakistan and Afghanistan up here. And north of the Tibetan Plateau is the Taklamakan Desert. Um, this is uh, where the Silk Road went through the Pamir Mountains that come up uh, from um, Asia Minor up in, and across into uh, Asia. And it was the highway to China trade route. Um, so India as a continent about 50, 60 million years ago had moved away with, uh, with plate tectonics, uh, continental drift, if you will, um, and this, this dynamics. Earth is this dynamic planet, just as everything is moving in space and the satellites and we go around the sun, the satellites go around the Earth. Um, over time, and we can actually see this across um, Afghanistan and Iran is, is how twisted, like taffy, these mountain chains are. And it illustrates how the Earth's surface, and we know, you know volcanoes are a testament to this, this hot interior of Earth, it's warm, and it's plastic nature. So 50, 60 million years ago is when India, this continental mass, collided with Asia. And it started to force up the Himalayan mountains. These mountains are still building today. What I'm going to do is actually fly us in a little closer 
And that question that happened earlier uh, about uh, the, the thickness of the atmosphere, it, uh, you know, your altitude uh, depends on, on how thin the atmosphere looks. And I actually love that question because at this point, I, I'm going to try to pause so that, uh, and maybe I'll just show you as we get closer, the Tibetan Plateau sticks up far enough to where you see that cutoff with the atmosphere. And if I go farther to the left, it's lower altitude. You see the glow of the atmosphere. This is a beautiful glow. It gives us the, the blue that we see of, of the sky. That is reflected in the ocean. Um, and so that uh, the ocean actually is quite dark, but it reflects the blue of the sky. And so we think of the ocean as blue. Um, I'm flying along the, these, uh, these mountains. And of course, um, they, they force up this forest that we see. This is analogous to what we saw um, with the biome of, uh, of, of the rainforest. And then we went to desert. This is an alpine biome. And the flow of uh, the Indian monsoon comes in from the south. And uh, that carries, um, again, warm, um, uh, humid air across um, from the Bay of Bengal and, and to the, the uh, west of India, it flows up, and this, this flow is impeded by the height of the Himalayas. Just looking at my time here, um, I am going to try to bring you to Mount Everest. I, let's, uh, let's just come down. Um, down below us, uh, the river that we see is the great river Ganges, and if I just pan over is the Brahmaputra River, and they flow together into the Bay of Bengal uh, over on the right. Uh, but the, the, the roof of the world that's been called the Himalayas, if I just come in close enough here, is that uh, uh, it allows um, uh, me to illustrate uh, a, a, an important point, And that is that um, as you go up higher, of course, it becomes colder and colder. Um, the flow of air, free, you know, is, it flows up here and uh, any uh, um, humidity that that air is carrying then condenses out and... Uh, and feeds these glaciers, uh, the, the, the snow on these mountains, and it flows down in, in these glaciers. So Mount Everest is uh, just ahead of us over on the right. I'll uh, pilot us in. Uh, let me bring, uh, okay, just come a little lower in here. And uh, so this this mountain right here is, is Mount Everest. Now, when I come down low enough like this, and I just look up and we can see uh, we still see the stars of the atmosphere because we have the stars turned up kind of bright to see them all together. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the stars, of course, are always there. Even when we look up into a blue sky, we know that they're there. But there's Mount Everest. Up here, uh, of course, we have snow leopards and other cats that are, are adapted to these, these regions. Um, and, of course, many people want to climb Mount Everest now. So this is almost a highway of people going up there. Um, but, uh, and then we can see these glaciers, these, these sort of tongues of, if you will, along, along, uh, these, these various gullies and so forth that are eroding, but they're, these glaciers actually grind the mountains down. So as soon as the mountains are built, they're ground down. The Himalayas are still growing. And, uh, then also, uh, so India is sort of subducting. It was a big fault. It, uh, is sort of going underneath. Um, uh, Southern Asia and creating this Tibetan plateau that we see. So the last biome I want to get to, and I see Graham has a question, is uh, we're going to head off toward uh, the east coast of Australia and we're going to go to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, the resolution is uh, data, you at this distance, quite incredible. Um, Graham, that's, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, uh, the Esri map that we have, uh, we actually have two things. We have an elevation map that allows us to see, um, you know, not just the two-dimensional surface, but also um, we have the elevation of the mountain. So we can come down and see that data uh, where it's really good down to even the size of a human being. So uh, let me just um, adjust time for us. Uh, let me bring the earth up. I'll pull back a little bit so that we can see it uh, all in total and um, uh, I have to I'm actually running time backwards um, the uh, um, the show sharp uh, okay we're are we back 
it, things dropped out for me just a little bit. Here's the continent of Australia, our smallest land continent. Uh, actually, I'm wondering if Antarctica um, or, uh, or Australia is, is the smallest continent. Um, sorry to be thinking on my feet. But let's come up here to the northeast coast of Australia. This biome of, of a reef community is really important because so many uh, of the fish that we rely on um, are, are sort of born in these reef communities. And these reef communities are, are fragile. Um, also, the east uh, coast of Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, I'm going to point this out uh, for us um, right along here. So that this is this barrier reef, it, it forms out in front and protects essentially um, this coastline of, of Australia. But notice how the, the shallows, I've talked about the bathymetry of the ocean, is that we see that as well. And that the, the barrier reef has grown up essentially. Um, and why has it grown here? Well, Australia had the sort of right conditions for the ocean circulation at a time when after the ice age, when the, uh, the, the ice essentially made the ocean shallower than it, than it should be essentially, or, 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 or is um, um, uh, now. And, and so uh, as, as the glaciers melted, it, it, it uh, caused sea level rise. And uh, so as that occurred, in the case of Northeast Australia, the uh, barrier reef started to grow. So my, I pressed a button errantly as I was jumping around. Um, and uh, so as we, I'm just going to get close enough now so that we can see um, this, this uh, barrier reef. The reef tends to be about, uh, you know, a few tens of thousands of years old. Um, and uh, so, but the, the life on it is really this, this skin. It's, it's very thin. And so the reef builds up on top of um, the previous life. And so basically as, as, the, the, uh, as, as the oceans slowly sort of filled and got deeper, these reefs grew one on top of the other, building up over time. And that, uh, so this is calcium carbonate skeletons. And as we have seen, the reefs are, are dying away. Now, we understand this. Partly because under a global warming scenario, this is one of the one of the indicators of, of global warming, is that the ocean starts to take up more carbon dioxide. It starts to acidify, and uh, that that starts to eat away at the uh, at the very basis of the reef. And uh, so the reefs have, have and that acidification is bad for the life that's again very thin that lives on top of the, this sort of skeletal underpinning. And um, so the reef retreat has been an indicator of global change and uh, is, is quite concerning for us. So I'm going to uh, rise up here above the earth and um, I'm just um, see what time it is. Uh, one of the last points I'd like to make after looking at these biomes of the rainforest, the desert, the alpine, um, we talked about the poles just a little bit. But, um, and then I'm going to pull back so that we can see our beautiful planet. Um, you actually, one thing I want to point out that the satellite picks up on um, and uh, is just right over here. You'll notice that in the oceans that uh, you may see this kind of, I have to, okay, I need to point this out by, <laughs> what's it going to, this kind of interesting windowing problem I have to do. Do you see this kind of, uh, you see the clouds? But you also see there's a brightening of the ocean that's here and here. And then there's here's one of these discontinuous lines from the mapping. What the satellite's actually picking up is the sun's reflection off the ocean. And this is an artifact of the mapping. And uh, it's just something that, that, uh, that we see in the imagery. And it's actually kind of pretty, but it also belies just the, the reflectivity of the sun, and of course, across a uh, reflective ocean, but not across the land. So this is uh, Australia, and then up here we have Indonesia, this is the island of Java, and there's Bali in there, and this is Borneo, it's another rainforest, Sumatra further up, um, exciting stuff. 
Um, what I'm going to do is go into nighttime. It's so beautiful looking at the Earth. The astronauts talk about how beautiful it is. It's that uh, you know, it's, it's it's spellbinding in a way. Yeah, let me do this. Okay. Uh, oh, there's another question. Do you know where there are more seven uh, seven point five billion people living on Earth? This, um, this is sort of a factoid, um, but I'm going to now show you some artifact of that exact thing. Um, thank you for Cor thank you, Corey, for putting that up. I'm going to go into nighttime, and uh, so uh, let's uh, um, let's let's do that in this way. We're going to run time forward, and uh, okay, just have to adjust my time scale and hit go. And this, we're going to see the satellites going around again. Now we're we're going um, prograde in time. So um, as we as north is up, we see the constellation of Orion coursing behind the Earth. And now notice that uh, Australia is about to go it's, it's, uh, um, into the darkness. So the darkness is coming up from the east as the Earth is, is rotating in, in this direction. And uh, so they rotate in an eastward direction, and we're going into nighttime. And, uh, of course, this happens in 24 hours, and night and day. We experience this all the time. But if I now come uh, just over to the sort of night side of Earth, we can start to see the city lights. And uh, this is thanks to NASA putting this tremendous uh, city lights map together um, from the year 2012. Um, we see not only on the east coast of Australia um, the lights of Brisbane and uh, and then we see Sydney and Melbourne, uh, Adelaide. We also see lighting from mining in uh, Western Australia. As I come uh, farther up, I'm going to sort of turn, I'm going to pause time for a moment so that we look at uh, the lights of Asia. And if I come in close, we can see the tremendous population of Indonesia on the island of Java. Um, and then I have this set with just enough light so that we can see also. Uh, let's see if I can. Uh, I might want to point out a few places here. We can see this is Borneo. We have the Philippines. This is Manila. Um, and then uh, let's see. I'll just start the Earth rotating a little bit like so. And uh, so now we can see this is the island of Sumatra. Not a lot of people. This is Singapore and Kuala Lumpur. This is, this is the Malaysian Peninsula. And uh, then we see Southeast Asia. Here's Bangkok, a place I'm very familiar with and, and I have many friends. Hi, hi to there, and here we see Phnom Penh and, and uh, Cambodia, and this is um, Ho Chi Minh City in the coast of Vietnam. And now I'll just point out the tremendous population of, of China that we see here. And so this is, these are, are many communities in China. This is Hong Kong. We also see uh, the highly populated west coast of the island of Taiwan. We can see up here um, uh, Japan. And we can see Korea, and it's South Korea, more lit up than North Korea, and uh, the Beijing, and this is the area around uh, uh, Shanghai in, in China. And uh, we can just see many, many communities uh, that have populated along uh, uh, rivers, actually. This is, uh, have been, uh, rivers have always been a uh, trade route uh, for easy uh, transport of goods. And uh, we'll see that play out uh, here a little bit more as I go uh, farther west, and I'm gonna run time a little bit more revealing um, uh, India. And we can see uh, just with a little bit more, we can see not many people are living in, uh, <laughs> in, uh, in the Tibetan Plateau, uh, but I'll point out that's the city of Lhasa, and this is Delhi over here, and how India is very uh, populated. Now, um, I neglected to say that in uh, the alpine regions and the snows uh, that are created at altitude, as they melt and create the glaciers, they feed the great rivers. I pointed out the rivers Ganges and Brahma Brahmaputra, but we can also see illuminated here in Pakistan, we can see um, the population is all along the Indus River as it flows down into the Indian Ocean. And see, so that we can see how population settles along rivers. And the, Him the Himalayas uh, basically run seven major river systems. So we have the Indus, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, actually 
the Seer and Amun Daryam going even farther uh, if we go further into like Kazakhstan and so forth. But also across uh, China, we have the Yellow River, the Yangtze, and then across Southeast Asia, the Irrawaddy, Salawane, and the Mekong rivers. And so that, uh, that the snows of the Himalayas feed the populations of India and China and Southeast Asia over half the world's population is reliant on those snows. And we know that those glaciers are beginning to sort of thin and go away. So this is, this is a concern in global change. So here we, we can see that the population as indicated by uh, the city lights in our globe. And uh, just looking at our time, um, yeah, Carter, that was great. Um, we do yeah, have some questions if you want to take them now. Sure. Awesome. Okay. Steven's asking another question. Great. Thanks, Steven. Um, do any of the orbiting satellites have uh, ground penetrating radar capable to visualize underneath the surface? Thank you. Um, yes, in this way, uh, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not familiar. Thank you for the question. I'm not familiar with the name of the particular satellites. Um, but we are very concerned about the thickness of ice sheets, such as Greenland and, uh, of course, Antarctica. And so in this way, the, the ground penetrating radar can actually tell us the uh, thickness of ice. We actually do this on other planets. We're doing this on Mars. Um, so that, uh, um, and we're planning on doing that uh, to test how thick the ices are on the uh, second moon out from Jupiter, Europa, which actually has more water than Earth um, in a, a thick liquid uh, water ocean under that ice. So that's a great question. Awesome, and I'm wondering if maybe we can fly. I, you mentioned deserts and you mentioned yeah. the poles. So oh, Jenna's yes. wondering, what does a polar desert look like? It's hard to oh, imagine okay. a desert in somewhere so cold. Well, um, I, uh, I really like that, that question, Jenna, and uh, give me a chance to come up to um, a place that is, um, if you've ever flown uh, in the summer, uh, back and forth between Europe um, and uh, the United States, I'm gonna come up close to um, here. Uh, uh, if I get close, uh, the, the, the uh, daily image sort of is, is toggled off, but I actually wanna keep that on. We're coming up to Greenland mm. and, um, and, and Iceland. Um, and, uh, you might wonder why um, uh, Greenland is called Greenland. It's, it's, it's all ice, and then Iceland doesn't have as much ice as is, is not called Greenland. Um, and that's because the Vikings, I think they, they realized that Iceland was so nice, they, 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 uh, uh, they called it Iceland to ward off people. And Greenland, go to, go to Greenland. <laughs> it's all ice. But here we can actually see um, the glaciers. Um, this is kind of a summer image. Um, that illustrates the, the glaciers of Greenland and this um, this sort of con it's it, I, so Greenland is an island technically but it's a large island and so it's it's covered with a sort of uh, continental ice sheet like Antarctica and I just thought uh, I would fly over this because um, what I wanted to show is the following and it actually dem it will give me a little demonstration of open space which is nice. Um, what I want to do, there's the SM, SMPP satellite uh, that will actually give us the images that we're about to see. Let me pause here. Um, I don't want to turn this into a, a big demonstration, but I think it's worth doing. And I just want to come up to make sure that I'm going to freeze on the sort of daily image. And if you will, I'm going to go back a few months uh, under uh, to summer conditions. So in open space, I'm now going to go from October to September, August, let's go to July. Okay. And in this case, I'm looking at July 2nd. I'm waiting for the data to report. There it is. Okay. So it's coming in. There's, there's the, the satellite mapping. And as I come in, we can see, um, this is very interesting. This is, this is what, uh, um, climate scientists look at or, you know, the, uh, um, er, the different years uh, to look at uh, on the extent of the Arctic sea ice and that um, you can look on a daily basis and actually see the calving off of, of the ice um, from, 
from the ice sheet uh, edge right here. And I'll just, I'll pause here for a moment to, for this to come in. Now I've, I've sort of uh, gone quickly here and what we're seeing in a daily image of course is weather. And uh, so what are the conditions on any particular day? So what is climate? Um, and uh, Allegra has uh, been in our chat, so she maybe answered this a lot better than myself since she is a climate scientist. But it's interesting that uh, climate uh, really is just average weather. And so um, depending on you know climatic studies, it depends, well, how long of a time scale are you thinking about? Um, in our conversations uh, with Allegra leading up to this program, it was a very interesting uh, point just about the Himalayas and that the Himalayas in their collision 50, 60 million years ago and rising up caused a, a diversion of the circulation patterns that existed before and caused this great drying north. So you have the, the uh, um, you have this tundra of the Tibetan Plateau, beyond that the Taklamakan Desert and, and off into Mongolia and um, uh, the, the kicking up of a lot more dust, and that this may have contributed to the growth of the ice sheets and the ice age um, from just the, the, the dynamics of, of Earth um, in uh, changing that climate in many different ways. And uh, so um, in this way, uh, we can look across time. And um, the one thing that, that gets kind of frustrating is that, that uh, like right now, um, this is set for July, uh, we can see all the way up to the pole. You can actually see the sort of, uh, the way that open space sort of pinches the data right up at the pole. At the, if I got really close to it, wait a few minutes and all that data would come in. But uh, um, uh, what's frustrating, what I mean by frustrating is that as you go across time, of course, we go into winter and then we can't really see the extent of the sea ice. Um, but this was a beautiful day. Here we can see uh, um, Iceland and we can see uh, uh, Greenland on the left, uh, Iceland sort of coming in, I'll pull it into the middle. Oh, and also if I come closer, you can see contrails. And uh, so uh, that's, that's what these long thin clouds are that, that are linear. And uh, so those are contrails from airplanes flying across, uh, flying across Iceland. And you can see the glaciers of Iceland, Vatnajökull over here, and, and so on. A, a beautiful place. I've only seen it from the air. One day I hope to go there. Yeah, that's beautiful, Carter. Thank you I'm so much. Not sure much. if there are any other questions. We're, we've just got maybe a time for one one more. We have time for one more. Let me get to it really fast. I'll pull back out a way. Uh, it's a little bit of comparative uh, planetology for you. Great. Uh, how, how does the Earth compare to a gas giant, for instance? Oh well, this this is this is very interesting. Um, that um, the Earth, because it has this this uh, um, warm interior, that, that uh, we have uh, a magnetic field around Earth that's that's, that's uh, caused by a liquid outer core, and uh, that the that the very inner core seems to be solid. Um, but uh, we believe that this this flow, uh, this sort of liquid. Um, outer core and it's metal, so it, it creates a dynamo of magnetic field. Uh, but then you go out to the outer planets, and uh, Jupiter has an extremely powerful and strong magnetic field. And so what we we think we're seeing is sort of um, metallic hydrogen as these flows, and that's that's because you have tremendous pressure. Is uh, Jupiter is the biggest planet in the solar system, so you have this pressure, but then you have this sort of light gas, and so it's it's, uh, it has sort of unique physical properties and uh, the details of which I do not know. So <laughs> I'm probably not the right person to ask about that. No, but then we can see these magnetic fields at uh, Saturn and Jupiter and, uh, and uh, the, the outer planets in general. Oh, great, thank you so great. much. I think we're gonna wrap it up for today. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, thank you to our chat scientists, Marina Gemma, Dr. Allegra Legrand. Um, thank you to our partners. Um, if you want to find out more about what you've seen, uh, you can visit our open space website at openspaceproject.com. Um, the, a really fun thing to do is to check out the Space Science Institute Sci games. I love to play them. Um, they're very fun web-based games. Um, 
we really appreciate hearing from you. Um, we're going to put this link in the chat, um, and that will lead you to a, a short survey. Um, and the first 30 responders will receive a NASA logo sticker in the mail. So that's pretty cool. Okay. Um, so thank you again. Uh, we really appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you next time.